Come along, children. Now we're going to have a little music. Dance, the biggest show since Game of Thrones. Uh, it is the show that has gotten us through quarantine. Us basketball fans have been dying for any kind of basketball content, and I, for one, can speak to that. Joining us today, I have my 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 Chicago Bulls, my own Chicago Bulls, uh, representing the Boston Celtics. <laughs> we have Mr. JTE in the house. What is up, dude? Yeah. What's up, man? We I'm, got I'm, to see a little bit of Larry Bird. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm happy. <laughs> I, I'm going to say you're our star center, man. You're our star center. You're the big man. You're getting all the reach bounds. out of all of us. <laughs> you probably are. <laughs> uh, we also I have Mike have Ellis the in the house. Uh, I see yeah, you look, with the Spurs uh, jersey, man. Yeah, because this was the next dynasty to come rolling into the NBA after the Chicago Bulls because the Spurs won their championship. They're first to five the next season, and which was the strike shortened season. That's what I think the Bulls would have won if they had stayed together, but the Spurs took it. And I don't know if JT didn't get the memo, but this documentary is not about Tom Brady. So I don't know why you're wearing a Patriots sweatshirt right now. This is I basketball. mean, we think of greatest of all time, Jordan Brady. They're both, you know, in the same league. Oh. I, I mean, already you know. starting out with. So wow, why that's, not? that's a very hot take. That's a hot. Yeah. That's one of the hottest takes I've heard in a long time. That's not even that hot of a take. That's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a take. That's just fact. Uh, Greatest football player ever. Brady's yeah. one of them, if not the top. Our Jordan, star the top. forward. <laughs> Uh, Mr. RB3 repping the Lakers. Got to represent, you know what I mean? Even though, you know, Magic hasn't fared so well so far in this series. Um, they got to they gotta get to to some classic, uh, nine, you know, 80s and 90s uh, Lakers competition hopefully soon too. Uh, maybe there's a Kobe doc in the works, hopefully. You never know. So, you know, got to make sure I'm repping the Lakers squad hard. Yeah, obviously, guys, I want to get your takes on the last two episodes, but I kind of want to break the mold. I want to start off with our overall thoughts. This was a 10-episode part docu-series, documentary, whatever you guys want to call it, but it, it works well as sports content, but it also works well as an actual movie. RB3 and I talked about the fact that this is going out to people who maybe didn't know about Jordan, maybe who aren't sports fans, but either way, guys, we finally got through all 10 episodes Overall thoughts, how do you feel? Do you feel like this is uh, one of the best documentaries? Do you feel like this was just a good quarantine vibe? Uh, let me know, Mark. I feel like this documentary was everything that I wanted and so much more than that, because this is what me as a sports fan has been just begging and pleading really my entire life with people who don't watch sports is that this has such a cinematic quality. This is so much drama. There's so much suspense. There's so much human interest in sports, and it can come out particularly if you have the extended amount of behind the scenes footage that we had from the 98 season, but also the journey documenting Michael Jordan. Jordan's career, the Chicago Bulls' dynasty, all of that stuff is just so filled with really every genre. If you walked into a blockbuster video, the one that's still there in Oregon, if you walked in there, you would see all these different sections. You'd see comedy, action, drama, horror movies. This documentary we just watched had everything. It had everything that you could possibly want, not just in a sports documentary, it had everything that you want in any quality piece of entertainment. And so the fact that we got spoiled with 10 episodes of this, it was worth the wait. And I don't say that lightly, Andres, because this wait for me was when I saw the ad for this two years ago, a year and a half ago around Christmas. And I was so excited because I thought it was coming out like the next week. And then it said 2020. And I was like, Jesus Christ, I got to wait that long. And then 2020 rolls around. Then they say it's not coming out till June. And I'm like, oh, God, maybe there could be a pandemic or something happens. It gets us this documentary <laughs> a month sooner. And so my prayers were answered. Yes, uh, everything you just said, I echo that 100%. That, that's what JTE and RB3 and I discussed last week, how this is a movie. Like, people forget, like, we're watching a film, and mm -hmm. the fact that it happens to be about one of the best teams of all time, and it happens to be about 
who I consider to be the greatest basketball player of all time, Michael Jordan, is just extra sauce on top that we get to explore this and enjoy this. Uh, JT, overall thoughts? Yeah, to hammer home the cinematic vibe of this documentary, at one point when Steve Kerr is telling a story, the music from the Danny Boyle film Sunshine is blaring and building. And I'm like having flashbacks to that movie. And they also used it in Kick-Ass with the Hit Girl sequence. Mm. I'm like, this is one of the great like cinematic scores. And they put it in with the Steve Kerr, you know, the last second shot. He's the new Paxson. Jordan is getting double teamed. So for me, I'm like, yes, this is what I love about sports and movies combined. To me, if you love movies, I don't know how you don't love sports in a lot of ways because it is in a lot of ways very much... It's all, again, it's about the story, the characters. You get to know these people. It's almost like a great TV series. The drama behind the scenes and just the craftsmanship of basketball gets displayed to you without a screenwriter, without a director. It happens in real time. And you get to see those moments that you watch on the big screen that are so, you know, yes, they're created, but you still get up in it. You get to see it in real life. And that's what I love about sports. Yeah, I mean, especially basketball, right? Like even the modern era, which is something that I'm much more familiar with as I keep up with a lot of games. I, I watch the basketball game every day. RB3 knows that when the, league, when the league was actually happening and when the season was going on, it's something that I keep up with. You get so much drama in basketball, in the NBA, almost more than any other sport because of what Michael Jordan created with this individualistic style of how I'm a star, I'm a star, and who's the star? Who's going to pass the ball? Who's going to take the last shot? Those are all dramatic effects that happen in almost every team in the NBA, except for maybe my team. Uh, but even our team has some dramatic stuff going on sometimes with Devin Booker. Uh, but either way, that's what we love about basketball. As much as us fans love the content of what's on the court, we also love kind of this outside perspective of who's the star, who's taking the charge, who's leading the team, who's, what's the conversation in the locker room. But all this stuff that we get to see in this documentary, it's exciting because this is what I've been saying to people who don't watch basketball for years. I'm like, dude, you're missing out. It's so good. Uh, RB3, your overall takes. Yeah, no, um, this was one of the, my favorite experiences uh, just ever on uh, watching any kind of TV show. Um, I really honestly um, loved the story that it was telling. Like you guys talked about the cinematics of it, the the editing and the way they did the pacing. And we talked about the timeline before, like how they kind of jump like back and forth and back and forth. I think that was a really cool way to tell it. Like, I think it would have just been boring if it was just like a straight through like retelling of like the, the whole dynasty. Um, but the way they did it was really interesting. Um, the moment, one moment that kind of stood out to me, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it more later, was learning about like Steve, Car Steve Kerr's father's uh, situation and stuff like that. And um, how he, you know, how he, every time they do the national anthem, he's like thinking about him. And then they go, you know, cut back to 98 season with that close up of him, uh, you know, actually listening to the national anthem and transition back into it. So it's just, they do a lot of really great things that really do, does a lot of humanization. Because like we said before on, the, on, uh, on our recaps, you think of these players, you think of them as like larger than life figures, like these impossible idols that everybody looks up to. But um, at the end of the day, the, these guys are just human and they did a really good job showing you the human side of these like super talented athletes. Yeah, it's something that that they did in the ads. They did a really good job. Uh, Mark, you mentioned the, the commercial that came out promoting this movie uh, was showing that Michael Jordan, you're going to see a different side to him. And, and I think they even got a quote from Jordan saying that after you watch this documentary, you might have different thoughts about me in a negative aspect. Uh, the biggest question that everyone keeps asking, and now that the documentary is over, do you like Jordan more after seeing this or less after seeing this? Is this somehow giving you respect for what he did and what he delivered? Or do you see him more as like maybe taking it too far in certain instances? And I'll go to you first, RB3. I mean, I've always thought he's – I've never really thought he was the most, like, um, like generous guy, likable, whatever you want yeah. whatever you want to call it. I mean, I think nobody would really think that of Michael Jordan. But, you know, you can't deny his, his, his ability to play the game. You can't deny – you can't deny his ability to just go out there and just tear apart and just rip through any kind of defense, any kind of offense. I mean – you see it. You see it here. I mean, even uh, they talked about the infamous like flu game 
which I guess was a food poisoning game actually this entire time. Um, but yeah, it was just crazy. He has like the most determination to the point of like, he literally has to be carried off the court to get him to, to stop, stop playing and stop winning. So that's, some, that's some really cool stuff. Mark. Yeah. I, I think that Jordan was genuinely thrown off a little bit after his hall of fame induction speech with the reaction that that received. I think that that didn't, it, it didn't land to most people the way that he might've thought it would. And I think that maybe because up to that point, basically everything he did, even if it was going to play baseball or it was coming back again to play for the Wizards, it was treated as something as, hey, look at this insane competitor trying something, trying to accomplish something, and that's something that we admire. The fact that he still couldn't let all this stuff go and that it still fueled him by the time he was going into the NBA Hall of Fame, I think a lot of people were were thrown off by that. And so I think that he was a little more cautious going into this documentary. Like, I don't know how people are going to react to that. But for me personally, I loved watching it. I've always loved him as a competitor, I've always loved him just watching him play basketball, but I think seeing the human component of it, I don't know if we'd be best friends. I don't know what, what teammate I would be on the team, but I think that when you watch this, if you've ever played a sport, you want to know how you would have stacked up. Mm -hmm. If you had the athleticism or whatever other set of circumstances necessary to get you on that team, maybe I would have been Scotty Burrell. Maybe I would have been Steve Kerr. Maybe I just would have been Rusty LaRue and barely even mentioned, but ah. you want to know how you stack up against the best. So I think people that, that get alive when competition is afoot, whether it's, it's basketball or it's, it's a movie trivia competition or it's we golf. That's something that resonates when you see Michael Jordan, because we can talk about the goats and JT, you know, we're talking about Tom Brady being the best quarterback of all time. There's a lot of greats in a lot of sports, but there's very few people that get to that next level that have their, their competitiveness and their greatness become a mythical quality. And that is something that has happened with Jordan. I think that that was reiterated every Sunday for the last five weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously before I go to UJT, I, I want to mention kind of to reiterate my point is, is Ken Burns actually recently gave a quote mm -hmm. saying that this is, this is poor journalism and it's a poor documentary because Jordan had to sign off on everything. And it's almost his version of events and not the version of events and correct journalism. And it's true. Jordan did have to sign off on this and this all had to go through him, which is kind of, frustrating but at the same time he did let a lot of vulnerability come out something that we might have not seen before i don't know if you have any thoughts on that jt yeah well i think the fact is and this is one thing i was wondering towards the end of this documentary where are they going to go into you know when he came back to play with the wizards like are they going to touch on some of this stuff but at the end of the day this is called the last dance it's not called michael jordan the documentary they really touch on all the other players and i think that's something that the director was actually you know what okay maybe i can't do a complete michael jordan documentary but i could put it it's going to fill most of it but i could fill it in with interesting stories about rodman scotty pippen kerr phil jackson so mm -hmm. i don't think i don't know like how much did jordan have to sign off on those guys was it really just the stuff that he was involved with or did he have to sign off no you can't say that about steve kerr i just, i have a hard time believing that was the case for all the characters in this so for me i think again this is the last dance this is not michael jordan the documentary even though he is heavily featured obviously yeah, yeah. just uh, Andres, the way i feel about the ken burns quote is that I, I think that his quote is accurate is that it's it's not well, i'm not but i'm not looking at this to be a, a bastion of journalistic integrity. What I'm looking at in this documentary, and I think that if you look at it from, you're just trying to tell what actually happened, you're missing the point of why we're so wrapped up in this. It's because Michael Jordan is a guy whose face was everywhere, still is everywhere. It's on basically every, every line shoe. of clothing imaginable. We're probably wearing his shorts right now. But we never got to know this version of Michael Jordan. That's what I'm excited about with this documentary because you can look up box scores you can go watch old games you can you can see all the stuff that i am old enough to have lived through most of but you never got this when i was a kid you never got this side of michael jordan so if we have to put a little bit of a slant on what actually happened in order to get michael jordan talking this candidly about his own life i would say sold all day every day yeah, and it's one of those things that I feel like a lot of basketball fans or maybe non-basketball fans 
don't realize we've talked a lot about uh, Kobe RB3 and I have talked a lot about Kobe and how he kind of mimicked everything Jordan did and that's not a negative thing to say about Kobe I, I almost think it's a positive thing because he realized those are the shoes that I want to fill and and reaching that high to reach the level of Jordan but I've also seen behind the scenes videos and a lot of people talk about behind the scenes that Kobe was kind kind of a jerk to his a lot of his teammates and he would he would always require you to go further and go beyond even though you didn't have it in you uh i recently mentioned a, a video of him just berating his teammates telling him to get traded and to get lost uh i think even jeremy lynn uh came on uh sports center or espn mentioning that that's 100 percent accurate and that he called them bums and that they're going to be traded but that's kind of the attitude that Kobe brought that same Mamba mentality attitude that kind of Jordan invented Jordan with Phil Jackson, in my opinion, because I still think he's the go um, just created this mentality of always winning and always being almost centered on, on the idea of championships. And, and I just love that idea because you see Phil say that in the documentary as well. But I, I, I personally, I loved it, man, because it really goes to show you the kind of almost borderline sociopathic, manner you have to go about winning championships if you're gonna win it almost every year and jordan almost won almost every year for his career which i think it's incredible considering that nowadays it's so hard to go back to back much less a three-peat uh but i want to get into the episode real quick guys it starts off obviously with the pacers and reggie miller and and that's the first thing i have in my notes is reggie miller in all caps like Reggie Miller is a great, like he's an incredible basketball player. And I feel like a lot of people forget about him. Uh, GT, what are your memories of this Pacers team? Yeah, again, it's Reggie Miller, Chris Mullen. I, I always have thoughts of going back and playing these old video games like NBA Live. Everyone yeah. plays NBA 2K now, but back in the day it was NBA Live. And I just loved playing with Reggie Miller. He hit every three. It was amazing. It was almost like a cheat code. Uh, so I feel like my love for basketball started with the basketball games in a lot of way. And when I think of Reggie Miller, I, I flash back to me and my friends playing NBA Live all night, drinking Jolt Cola and just having the best time ever. And then you go into, you know, Reggie Miller watching him. I love watching old footage of these basketball games and seeing some of their shots, which to me, every time Reggie Miller shoots a shot, it hits nothing but bomb the net and it almost looks not real. Like if you're watching like Mike, and he's, about, he's supposed to make every shot because he has magic shoes on. That's how Reggie Miller shot. Everything he shot was like, that looks like it should be Photoshopped or it was made in special effects because no shot could be that pretty. And that's, I, I feel like I don't get that as much today. I guess Steph Curry and even James Harden at times sometimes shoot like that. But Reggie Miller has one of the best looking shots of any player that I remember watching at least. Uh, Mark, you remember Reggie, you saw him play. Yeah, uh, I mean, look, Steph Curry and James Harden have pretty wet jumpers, JT. That's not, I was gonna say, those guys just to I was about to Reggie go Miller. at you. No, <laughs> but, I, I, all I'm saying when I watch this old footage, maybe it's the way it's edited, it just looks something about his shot looks just different to me. Like it, it looks perfect. And don't get me wrong, Steph Curry, I mean, amazing. I don't know. His his are almost like daggers. Curry has a lot of arc to his shot. Reggie's were like daggers straight to the bottom of the rim. And it was just, I don't know. It's crazy to me. I'll ask you, Mark, real quick. Uh, who do you equate him to nowadays? Because I kept thinking about it. And I know a lot of people have talked about Reggie Miller. But who, who do you think is his like mirror in, in current NBA, modern NBA era? I don't think there's anybody that is as feared as okay. Reggie Miller that has his particular skill set. I think Steph is just as dangerous. I, I think Steph might be a more dangerous three. Steph might be the most dangerous three-point shooter I've ever seen in my life. A Clay Thompson can get hotter than just about any other three-point shooter I've ever seen. Harden is so offensively talented. I'd probably compare him to Harden just because Reggie was never known for lockdown defense and neither is Harden. Um, but Reggie can never handle anywhere close to what Steph has been able to do. But when you look at Reggie Miller in the context of his career, what I found interesting about this documentary that it, it gives brushes of is that there's something that happens when Michael Jordan is becoming the greatest basketball player on earth, that everybody else in the league who are, who's older than him, it's like they're watching this comet blow by them, that they saw it coming. I mean, Larry Bird saw it coming. Magic saw it coming. Isaiah didn't want to admit it, but he saw it coming. And Barkley, it, who is sort of a peer of Michael Jordan, 
even acknowledges that Barkley had the best game of his life and he still couldn't beat MJ. But then you had something very interesting happen in the last three championships in the second three P when Jordan came back is that a lot in the same way where Tiger Woods was blowing everybody away who were his peers in golf. But then there's this young brigade of kids that grow up watching the greatest of all time. And they're not afraid of them in the same way that somebody who's already matched up on the court is. And so when Reggie Miller comes in the league, when Gary Payton comes in the league, they are not afraid of Jordan in the same way that Jordan's peers that he came into the league were. So they realized very quickly, you probably shouldn't talk a lot of trash to this guy. They learned how to play him, but they wanted their shot at it. And nobody gave it better than Reggie Miller. And I remember watching that series and I was so fascinated to go back and revisit it in this episode tonight because I was at a, I think I was at like a, some beach week or something. And we all were like just glued to the TV watching that Eastern conference finals go down and Reggie Miller hitting that shot to tie the series at two to two. I will never forget as long as I live. It was a great shot. The camera cutting back to Larry Bird and Larry Bird is the (laughs) only person in that arena who doesn't react at all. And I loved it because nobody else in Market Square Arena that night had been in that situation like Larry had. Larry knew what a great shooter Reggie is. Larry knew Reggie's going to make it before he shot it. And so to Larry, it was just expected. And I thought that was just such a cool moment of greatness acknowledging greatness with complete stoicism and and it's 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 to kind of go off that point the idea that you still know that jordan can come back and make a shot and he (laughs) almost did make that shot i almost Mm -hmm. i I was like that is going in that is there's no way that's just the luck of the draw that it just bounced out but rb3 obviously this is not your era of the nba but do you have any memories of reggie miller or how much have you seen him play well, I mean, obviously, like, towards the latter part of his career, um, like I said, lifelong Lakers fan. So I always saw him going up against a young Kobe uh, and, uh, a ver- you know, a, a, an up-and-coming Lakers team at the time, early 2000s to when they to, to when they won their championship, 2001. Um, but, yeah, I'm a big, big Reggie Miller fan. Um, I actually, you know, we had a – I don't know if the article's out yet, so I don't know how much we could talk about it. But we did a, we did a fan casting article for Geeks of Color – um, casting a lot of the people for um, for, for uh, around in the Last Dance uh, documentary, and um, I forgot who we put as Reggie Miller, but we we I made sure that we we, we had like a good um, a good young sprout up there because I feel like that for that particular role it it, it would require somebody who has like a simultaneous like kind of fun energy, a lot more lighthearted than like Jordan was in comparison but at the same time like equally as dominant not um, not equally but uh you know had had, had a kind of dominance and in, in ego and confidence that um persisted and allowed them to go so far in that series so yeah Richie was a killer man I, I think that's the best way to describe him like he was a killer when he took every shot he knew it was going in that's what's in his head he's like this is going in this is going in every time if i'm being honest guys he reminds me of uh clay thompson and I think a lot of people sleep on Klay Thompson. Obviously, we're all not Warriors fans here, so we all want to hate on them. But w- people forget, like, Clay isn't just a three-point shooter. Like, he's an incredible finisher. Like, when he goes to the rim, he goes to the rim. And he's, he's a bigger guy, too. He's not super small like, like Steph is. Like, Steph is tiny versus someone like Clay. So I, I immediately thought of Clay. And, I mean, people forgot, like, Clay scored, like, 38 points in a quarter. Like, Clay is incredible. He's one of the best basketball players in the league, in my opinion. So that's what he reminded me of. But I I just had to bring that up. But I love his attitude of going after Jordan and knowing that if this is this is who I want to be like, I want to end his career. That's kind of the idea that you have to go with. Uh, But obviously, the Pacers are are one of the best teams uh, that people remember. They're an incredible team. And the idea that Indiana is such a tough place to play at because there's so many basketball fans in Indiana. It's one of the biggest basketball states in the country, if not the biggest basketball state in the country. So I just love the idea of those arenas and playing in there. Any last words on the Pacers from you guys? Uh, Yeah, I love that when they were showing Market Square Arena back in 1998 in Indiana, there was one haircut, just one. (laughs) 
for for men, for women, you all got the same haircut. You had the little mullet going down here, like what I'm growing, and a little bit of fluff. This is basically a, a 98 Indiana cut, which is what I'm working with right now. So 20,000 people, they all went to the same super cut. <laughs> yeah obviously shout out to indiana i love indiana i've been to indianapolis yeah. a few times yeah same. uh so so no hate all love from for me on that part yeah and uh, before, rb3 do you have it oh go ahead i was gonna say i was gonna before, ask you if you have any questions oh uh any questions i don't have any any questions oh questions to read i was just gonna say yeah people who are watching this live we have 30 36 people watching live um so please everybody make sure you like uh make sure you comment make sure you Put uh, put a, a question in the chat room. Um, we're watching out for questions. Please use uh, Streamlabs. We have a Streamlabs link right at the top of the description of our YouTube video here. And we also have a uh, Super Chat. So if you want to donate through Super Chat and talk to us that way too, um, that would be greatly appreciated. But yeah, we're, we'll be taking some questions. Um, do you have any questions from from Super Chat so far, Andres? Or? Uh, I, I don't see any right now unless you see some. Uh, oh, yeah, let's we do, get actually. some super I, chats I in there. Look, I need everybody to donate on Super Chat and Streamlab, OK, because Robert and I have been talking about this. We need to raise enough money to buy Andres a basketball jersey of a team that's won a championship. We, it's something that he's wanted for so long. And <laughs> yeah. I think that we're ready to get you that it can be a Warriors. It can be a Bulls, whatever you want, Andres. We're here for you. <laughs> yeah, seriously. I don't know if you guys watch Game of Zones. Uh, it's an yeah. incredible Bleacher Report animated short that literally combines Game of Thrones mixed with like NBA drama. And it's the perfect show, in my opinion. They had a segment of how the Suns uh, combined with the Kings because they're the poor teams in the West to try to beat the Dream Team, which are the White Walkers. Uh, and, and it's, they do it like the, uh, like the Dothraki running towards the White Walkers in the final season of Game of Thrones. And they just get all, all the flames go out, man. The suns just get blown away by the White Walkers. So that's, that's what happens to us guys. I, trust me. I'm used to it. I'm used to it. <laughs> uh, Larry Lease, uh, says hit that like button guys. Oh, Hey Mark, any more weird dreams with OJ in there? Uh, no more weird dreams with OJ. I had a dream that I was at a comedy club and OJ Simpson was opening for me. Um, and he had a good set. Like, I, I don't want to say that he, he killed, but he, he had a good set. And, uh, I haven't had any more athlete dreams, but I have a feeling I got to have a mic dream at some point this week. Like I've just been ingesting so much of this bulls and, and everything else. There's gotta be a Jordan hop in somewhere in the dream or maybe phil jackson talks to me and i get to whisper some words of wisdom to him and then burn some sage toss into a coffee can so i'd be oh, up for be another sports dream this week yeah that sounds oh amazing. that sounds incredible uh have you guys seen the oj uh snl sketch that came out i believe like two weeks ago no, no? i don't think i've seen that one no. it, it's it's basically like a, a joke on the retired oj him being on Twitter and posting these super weird videos. It's really well done. Uh, <laughs> FJM72 says, side thought, everyone, Joe Montana is the GOAT, undefeated in Super Bowls and no interceptions. He's up there. He's good. Yeah, he's up there. <laughs> Josh, yeah. you want to take that one? <laughs> I mean, listen, that's Tom Brady's hero. Uh, that's the guy he looked up to his whole life. Uh, I, I, th I think when uh, he beat Atlanta, I think the debate was Joe Montana – versus Tom Brady. And after that Atlanta game, I think he kind of overtook him. And then the Rams game just kind of pushed over the top. Cause I was a huge Joe Montana fan growing up too. I love Steve young. I love, you know, those two quarterbacks back, but uh, I think the Atlanta game on, he kind of distanced himself a little bit from Montana. Yeah, I'm actually, we give you a lot of crap, but I'm actually with you on that. And uh, and it's not necessarily his passing ability. It's more of his winning ability. Uh, speaking of winning, uh, the flu game, which is now the food poisoning game, uh, was I the only one that was like, oh, that makes it so much worse as someone who's experienced incredibly awful food poisoning that almost killed me, uh, that it, it, it'll dehydrate you to the point that you cannot stand up because you're throwing up so much. Uh, and when I, when Jordan mentioned the IV being put in his arm, I was like, yeah, I've had that. It's not fun. <laughs> You're really, really out of it. You're pretty much destroyed. And the fact that he scored 38 points in that game, did, did you guys get any new perspective on the famous flu game? Um, I think that, first of all, I would love one of these many investigative journalism podcasts to do a deep dive into the pizza place that <laughs> sent five delivery guys 
to Jordan. How did they know it was Jordan? Like that, I think that that that's as much on Jordan and his team around him as is anybody else, because mm. you do not let them know that you're ordering a pizza for Michael Jordan, but they probably had to like, let the pizza place know, Hey, stay open because this is Mike's pizza or else they would have closed. So that's the only way I can think of like that. They knew that it was Michael Jordan's pizza. And that's why they laced it with freaking arsenic or acid or whatever the hell they put on that. But <laughs> something evil was on that pizza. But here's the thing. Here's how you know you've watched way too much basketball in your life is that I could tell watching that game in real time and watching the replay tonight is that Jordan is sweating even more than he usually did. <laughs> and all basketball players sweat tremendously amounts during a game. But you could see he was dripping buckets like I'd never seen somebody do before. So you knew that he was under the weather. And here's, here's a little fun, fun add-on that they didn't have in there is that at halftime, Jordan was obviously feeling like total crap. He had food poisoning all day. He hadn't eaten anything. And so he wanted some Gatorade at halftime. And somebody accidentally gave him Gator Load, not Gatorade, which is Gator Load is like a super carb heavy drink. Um, and it's not meant for during a workout. It's meant for like recovery afterwards. Totally different things. So that upset his stomach even worse. Wow. Uh, I need to mention one of the great cinematic films celtic pride uh i already want to write a spin-off movie about these three guys or five guys who worked at this pizza place came up with this whole idea poison the pizza i'm gonna cast vince vaughn in there maybe andy sandberg i'm working on the script as we speak i want a whole movie based about this food poisoning i think it's fascinating it's almost medieval, right? Like they try to poison the king, but he comes back and leads the army to destroy them. Like it, it feels like an episode of Game of Thrones where he's giving this huge speech with the sword out. And he's like, they have tried to poison me, but I will come back. And he's like giving it to his army as he leads a charge towards certain victory. Like it's incredible. I, this is why I love basketball. But that game is even more uh gives even more credit in my opinion knowing that it was food poisoning but the fact that he scored all those points and people talk about his obsession with winning it is just absolutely incredible i don't know if you have any thoughts rb3 yeah no nah, i mean that's just it's just craziness i mean that just shows you how much you wanted it versus everyone else on the court um a sick a sick michael jordan still better than every other player <laughs> apparently uh, uh on 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 his team and on the other team too so it's just craziness i mean it's 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 that's what really makes me – and I probably – I'm going to pose this question to, to uh, you three fellas and to everybody in the chat. Um, two questions, actually. For one, what is the better Phil Jackson team, uh, the, the Lakers uh, early 2000s or uh, the this, this Jor- this Jordan Air Bulls? Um, and the second question I would ask is what's the better Steve Kerr team, right? Like – the the championship uh going state warriors or 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 the bulls what what are you guys thoughts so i'll I'll go first and to answer your first question bulls uh sorry mr laker fan i know that's your team um but to answer your second question are you asking better in the sense like who would win in a matchup or better in the sense of like greatest teams of all time like greatest teams of all time then the bulls if kevin durant stayed on that team who knows what would have happened? I'm, I'm talking the Kevin uh, Durant like iteration, like no, I know, but I'm saying like you're saying better as in like of all time, what it's a standalone team, right? You're not saying in a matchup. Yeah, I mean, but I'm, what, what I guess what I'm asking is those like, are two different questions. Okay, then what did would your would your answer change during if it was a matchup? If it was I a think matchup? the best team of all time, as in who would win every single basketball game in a matchup is the Warriors. And I know that's a controversial thing to say, but I really do feel KD, Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, threes, range, uh, just it's too much for any team to handle, even the Chicago Bulls. And I know that's my hot take, but I think in a matchup, the best team is the Warriors. The greatest team is still the Chicago Bulls. So... The, the teams that the Bulls struggled with the most in the 90s were the teams that could get out and run and could score a lot in transition. So that's why the Sonics could occasionally flummox them with the Gary Payton, Sean Kemp combination. And that's why the Stockton Malone Jazz were such a thorn in their side that took them almost to the brink. But in a matchup, I think that it's it's close enough 
to say we need to know which set of rules that we're playing with. Mm. Um, I, I think that the teams are that close because if you're playing with modern day rules or with your, I think if you're playing back in the nineties, I think that the bulls win. I think that the bulls uh, clearly Steph Curry is one of my favorite players to ever live, but he also, if, if as Chris Paul showed it, if, if you can really be physical with that guy for four quarters, you can wear him down. I think the same thing can be said about Kevin Durant. And I think that if the bulls, were more three point set, more three point shooting focused like what the game is now. The Bulls had shooters on that team. I mean, they had Steve Kerr's a great shooter. They had a, they had shooters that are not as good and not as deep as what the Warriors could provide. But I think that the the Bulls had had such a way of imposing their game plan and their will on any opponent. So I think it'd be a really close call. And answer your other question, Robert. I think that the Lakers really did come into their own, but I just don't think that they were what they would ever be able to to get past the bulls in their prime yeah jt yeah you know when i think about the matchups i th- think the most important matchup would be scotty pippen guarding durant scotty pippen is one of the people who i'm watching this documentary i just forgot how long he is he reminds me of durant in some ways his arms just looks like they could reach for miles and I think out of all the matchups, you're not going to match up with MJ. I don't care who you put on him. But I think Scottie Pippen would actually hold Durant and actually get in his face and make the shots that he usually makes a lot more difficult. So I, I would kind of lean towards Chicago. I think you definitely Steph Curry is going to kill probably Kerr. But Kerr is one of the best three-point shooters, man. You can't count him out completely. Yes, you have Clay, But if you're going to give me Scotty and MJ – uh, and Rodman, I, I just got to go with. Well, that's the thing. We're we're, we're burying Sorry. the lead here because the matchup that we're all going to be watching the whole time is Draymond versus Rodman. Like that's the oh, one. Yeah. That yeah. I want to be. That, that, that's the one I want mic'd up. <laughs> that would yeah. be incredible. I, I both of those guys are notorious uh, for their defense and for their mouth. I think it would be amazing. But I still think you guys are missing the the elephant in the room. That I, I feel like range, man. I'm telling you, you have the two greatest shooters probably of all time on the same team with Clay Thompson, uh, Clay Thompson and Steph Curry. Like I've, I've as, as recency biased as it can go, but did you guys watch those games? <laughs> like there was no beating them. Like when they were close to being beat, it was mainly because either KD was out of the game or someone else was out of the game, but all three of them, they were kind of invincible. I, well, I think me, three, uh, three pointers, uh, three is more than two guys. Mm-hmm. I, I'm telling you, like, the game is so different now. I don't think they would have the same three-point range mm. that the Warriors have. Here's Let me just say this. I think people forget, you know, you, you think about offense, but I think Chicago, what made them one of the greatest teams ever was their defense. Sure. And sure. I don't know if Golden State has ever faced a defense quite like what Chicago had in those late teams. I, I just don't – I'm thinking of all the games they played against and all the series they won. I don't think – I think they were close to a team as good on defense as this Chicago Bulls team. So I think they would match them, man. I think that they would shut a lot of that. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I mean, if anything, it it shows you in this documentary, the biggest thing I learned was that obviously you have someone like a Scottie Pippen, one of the best defenders of all time. I still think Scottie Pippen is like, one of the best in the league during that time. I think he's incredible. But the idea of having Rodman, Pippen, on on just those two on defense is already enough to to put you over the edge. But then having Jordan actually be a pretty good defensive player as well, a really good defensive player, uh, just defense won championships. And you see that, especially with that Utah game, 54 points. Was I the only one that I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, my God. 54 Unbelievable. points. <laughs> I, think, uh, I, I think the last thing about the, the, the Golden State Bulls matchup is that okay. if, you're, if you're looking at the mental side of the game, um, I mean, Kevin Durant has a tough time getting uh, out of his own head when his teammates are involved. Mm. Like, if you can't handle your teammates calling you out in a heated situation, if you can't handle – randoms like us on Twitter calling you out. How are you going to handle what Michael Jordan is going to do mentally to you? That's that's the question that I have that's going to remain unanswered, but that's the thing that I want to know. Are you going to be able to, to suck it up and go out and drop 40 on him? 
or are you going to shrink in the moment? Now, Kevin Durant on the court has always tended to step up in big moments, but I'd like to see what the, the mental head game aspect of this matchup is. Yeah, I mean, the X factor is 100% KD. I, I still think he's great. I, I mean, the fact that he finishes when he puts his shoulder down, it's so hard for him, to, for anyone to guard him. And at the same time, having that kind of range and that kind of turnaround shooting that he has is, I don't know. I think KD, if, if only, like you said, Mark, if he, if he got out of his head a little more, I'd be a much bigger KD fan. But when he's coming at me on Twitter, it's a little hard. Um, <laughs> uh, either way, uh, let's go to that Steve Kerr segment real quick because uh, RB3 mentioned it, and I think it's actually pretty significant. The fact that Michael Jordan and Steve Kerr have that uh, father connection of both losing their fathers in a horrific manner, um, it, it, it's something that a, a lot of people know about, but I'm glad that people who maybe don't watch basketball were introduced to that aspect of his uh, story, of Steve Kerr's story. And, and I can't lie, guys, when they – cut to like this Steve Kerr segment I was like what is going on <laughs> like we're doing a Steve Kerr segment during the last episode uh or the second to last episode uh but obviously Steve Kerr and and people like Kerr were ahead of his time right because it's that outside shooter aspect of the game which now it's like almost everyone has that now almost everyone can shoot threes but the idea was during that time you have a specialized three-point shooter and that was Steve Kerr. And the importance of someone like a Steve Kerr would help when Mike would get doubled. He would just toss out to the, to the corner. Obviously, LeBron does this to, at the best that anyone has ever done this uh, currently in the game on your team, uh, RB3. So there's a shout out for your team. Um, but that idea of having a shooter like Kerr and having that connection, what do you guys think of that as a basketball moment and also as a, as a movie moment, as a dramatic moment? Uh, I'll start with you, JT. Yeah, I, it's interesting. And one thing I do like about this documentary is getting all these kind of small stories about all these players. And it's not, again, it's not just a Jordan documentary. And uh, yeah, Steve Kerr, man, he's the guy I always think of him. I just think of a three point shooter, deadly from outside. It helps to have Michael Jordan on your team to get those, you know, wide open shots when he's being double teamed. But again, you got to hit those shots. Sometimes it's harder to shoot when you're wide open than when it is you have a guy in your face because uh, it's not natural for a lot of these players. They're used to having somebody in front of them. So to step up in a big moment, especially the way that segment ends with him in the game winning shot, you know, he had Michael's respect. They got in that fight and Michael said, you know, he kind of mumbled to him, you know, be ready. And Steve Kerr stepped up to the plate and hit the shot. And that's huge. You get, you gotta give him a lot of credit for that. Yeah. Uh, Mark. I, I love seeing that soundbite of, of Jordan telling him to be ready on the bench and Steve Curtis hops up like, okay, you got it, pal. It's, just, <laughs> it's so great. Yeah. And Steve Kerr does have a little bit of that clutch gene quality that, that people like Robert Ory, who aren't necessarily the best player on their team, but just know how to step up when the spotlight's the brightest because he hit so many big shots like that for the Bulls, but also for this team in their championship runs. I mean, That's if right. you have somebody doubling Michael – or you have somebody doubling Duncan and they're looking for someone to kick it out and you see Steve Kerr, that's as friendly of a face as you're going to see. And he, I, I mean, he single-handedly, I remember won a game in the finals for the Spurs, knocking down a bunch of clutch threes in 2003. And it was uh, in 2005, I think it was actually. No, I think it was 2003. And he is just one of these guys that is going to be the unsung hero um, but I do remember that speech at the uh, at their victory parade when he made the joke about, you know, Michael saying, well, I'm not really comfortable in these moments. Let Steve take the shot. I remember watching that when I was still in high school and they played on Sports Center. And I just remember thinking just from a comedy aspect, like that's a really funny thing to take this this scenario and spin it into comedy where you're talking about the greatest of all time, but you're able to have a laugh with it. And mm -hmm. I, that was like something that I just remember. I kind of like saw that and I just kind of put it in my pocket for like, Oh, this public speaking thing. That's, that's one of the, the tricks that you can use to, uh, to get a laugh. And I, I haven't forgotten it. So I, I, I got to call Steve and tell him thanks for that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. That's a great moment. Uh, RB three. Um, yeah, that was, that was, that was a really great, uh, like you said, cinematic moment. Um, and yeah, I, I really appreciate, again, I, I appreciate the deep dives that they've given to a lot of characters. I mean, I feel like a lot of not characters, these are all real people, 
the, a lot of the moments that they used to highlight a lot of the real people in this uh, in this story. I mean, like you said, they gave um, John Paxson that little shout out like towards the beginning of the series. They, they gave Steve Kerr a shout out. They did a whole episode with uh, Dennis. Tony. Tony, yeah, Tony, uh, Tony, uh, yeah, every like all the the whole the whole, you know, for the most part, even Scott Burrell had a lot of fun moments <laughs> in there too. Um, and uh, I, I even appreciate in the, in the last couple of episodes just seeing him even still pick at him a little bit, like even as they're like in the finals. Um, yeah, I, I I really really appreciate it. Uh, you know, seeing this the Steve Kerr angle of it, I never really thought we'd we'd, we'd have to we'd consider that, but it's it's really cool. Um, obviously guys, we've come to that time to the biggest moment. And these last two episodes, I want to hit it, especially as we wind down towards the end of this, uh, coverage of this reaction video that we're doing right now. Uh, the biggest thing that we have to talk about Dennis Rodman on nitro (laughs) Monday night, nitro WCW. Uh, what, (laughs) uh, obviously that's not the biggest moment guys, but it's definitely a standout one for sure. Especially knowing that nowadays that would be the biggest sports story in years uh if that happened nowadays during the playoffs and during the finals uh and the idea of how phil jackson reacted to it too i'm obsessed with phil jackson i don't know if you guys know this already just just seeing this documentary and hearing about him for so many years just this idea of someone having hit this control of this crazy ragtag group of like a, a suicide squad of these killers that are all trying to do their own thing. And there's one leader who's trying to control it all. He's like the Amanda Waller. Um, but yeah, Dennis Rodman on Nitro. Any thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I think it speaks to how compelling of a story that this Bulls team was that the least interesting aspect of the entire documentary to me was a wrestling storyline that was huge for Nitro to have Dennis Rodman. And it's like, we're watching this, this thing play out for all these years and decades really of all these people's lives. And then Rodman goes and does Nitro and it's like, Oh, well we come to expect that from Dennis Rodman. But at the time it was, it, it wasn't shocking because even back then Rodman had already had so many, kind of antics that it was to be expected. You never counted him out doing something like that. But to me, it shows the leadership of Phil Jackson is that being a leader does not mean you're, you, you rule with an iron fist the whole time. You're not, you're not squeezing the life out of the ball 24 seven, you pick and choose your spots. And Phil Jackson with Dennis, whether it's him getting leave to go to Vegas for 48 hours or whether it's him doing nitro that Phil Jackson did not know he was going to do. It's that Dennis rejoins the team and Phil handles it. He never gets too high. He never gets too low. A, because he knows Dennis is going to show up when it matters, but also because Phil Jackson has control of the team. And it's not a guy who is going to be barking at you in practice. Phil Jackson was never that kind of guy. But we also always think of Phil Jackson as this peaceful Zen master. And I liked it in this documentary. It shows, no, he could get after you. He could he could chew your ass out if he had to. He, mm-hmm. he had all the tools but he just knew when to use what tool and when to lay off. Yeah, it's incredible. Obviously, to echo what you said, the idea of Rodman being one of the best offensive rebounders of all time. And for anyone who doesn't know basketball as well, offensive rebounds are like the hardest thing (laughs) to do in the NBA. It's notoriously one of the most exhausting things to do in the NBA. And the fact that he would go to nightclubs and then do all those rebounds is absolutely incredible. JTE. Yeah. I, the whole WCW thing at this point, they know what they're doing. They know who they have. I don't think it was that surprising. I feel like the attitude I got from Phil was like, yeah, that's, that's Rodman. Whereas it it felt like the media were the ones really kind of flaming the fires. Like how dare he go do this during a final Phil Jackson's like, he's going to be there. He's going to play. He's going to give his 110%. I think if Rodman showed on the court that it was really affecting him, then maybe Phil Jackson would have been a little more harsh. He would have nipped it in the bud. But when the guy's performing, if he has energy to go do a WCW thing, he hit a guy with a chair. It's not like he was doing off the top rope, running around, throwing tables on people. He was just a little segment. So to me, that's nothing. Jordan's up playing cards at like 2 a.m., smoking cigars. I mean, if that's what he wants to do, do it. If he wants to go hit somebody with a chair and, you know, walk around Hulk Hogan, whatever, man, win a championship. 
am I the only one too? Like maybe it's because I, I don't remember a lot of how the nineties were, I guess, as much as I thought, but everyone smokes a cigar at every second of this documentary. <laughs> I, I just think that's absolutely incredible. The idea of how nowadays, if someone posts a, a cheat day on Instagram, the NBA media is going to kill them. Uh, and, and these guys were just smoking cigars. Like, yeah, we just won tomorrow. We got a game. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> See, it's, it's funny. Cause I've been watching uh mad men and like, uh, and back in the 1950s, man, they used to just talk cigarettes. <laughs> yeah. It used to be like, and cigarettes was like chewing gum. They would just go and keep going and keep going. I feel like the 90s, especially like, you know, Michael Jordan always had like that famous image of him holding the, holding the trophy with the cigar. Like, I feel like yeah. that just became, that almost became like his signature thing. Like, even so much so, I feel like they even used his like lighting of the cigar, like all, all over the trailers. And it's like literally the intro of the whole documentary yeah. is, is him. It, it ends the documentary <laughs> yeah yeah literally literally so i, I guess it literally does cigars is, that's is, like we we really didn't know that much about that at the time like going through it like yeah you'd see jordan yeah. or anybody else who won a championship have their victory cigar but you, and you know if rodman's doing a performance on nitro i didn't watch nitro so it's like yeah I'm, I'm sure dennis rodman has that but it's like you really didn't see any of that stuff that's why this behind the scenes stuff is so fascinating for somebody like me who grew up watching the the news coverage and espn covering it and i watched all the games but i never saw the guys in the training room having a miller light after a game <laughs> when they had another game in two days and they're smoking so i never saw i didn't know that's what they were doing i mean it, you have to remember like it Back then, before social media, you just kind of watched these guys on TV and sure you followed them and you read press clippings and you saw a little bit of interviews on Sports Center, but it was almost like the you were at a theater and these performers came on the stage, they did their thing, and then they just went backstage and then they're just waiting backstage. And that's all they do. They they don't have lives, they don't have any of this other stuff. They just go back and they're sequestered, and then they come back for the next game. And then you realize, no, these are human beings. And so for somebody like Dennis Rodman, if he needs that outlet, he needs to feel that energy, he needs to feel that crowd. I think Phil Jackson knew that. I think that Phil Jackson probably said to himself, look, his doing Nitro is Michael Jordan playing cards until 2.30 in the morning. And if that is what he needs to get his mind right for the next game, then let him have it. Let the media run wild with it. I still know that I have control of my team, and that's all that matters. My um... it, it, it... Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say my favorite part of that whole uh, sequence was when uh, they had when they had all the media people outside of the uh, the locker room and they had to sneak <laughs> yes. them out the back and literally he was uh, running, yeah, he was <laughs> sprinting up those stairs. He was getting chased down. That was hilarious. I thought that was that was hysterical. That was I was crying, laughing so hard at that. Just the idea of literally running away from the media uh, reacting to that I, I thought that was incredible uh, obviously yeah echoing everything you said uh, one of my favorite parts of this entire documentary was that episode when Ma uh, when michael goes golfing uh and he says he says this little bit where he's like if it was any other coach we'd be running sprints right now we'd be running laps <laughs> on the weekend if it was a young coach but phil knows what he's doing he knows how to coach us and knows that we need this we need to play golf the night before the game, the day before the game, if we're going to be mentally ready for the next game. Uh, and I think of coaches like Tom Thibodeau, for example, who's notoriously uh, struggled coaching because of his iron fist mentality and how Phil Jackson mastered this kind of laissez-faire, but at the same time centering of yourself and being mentally focused in the moment. And at the same time, getting a lot physically out of their players. I just think it's fascinating because as a former athlete myself, I just can't imagine that. And, and especially being a swimmer and a former runner, mm -hmm. my first thought always goes to my lungs, my cardio. Like I, I can't smoke because it'll F me up. Uh, and this guy was just every single player. I was like, oh, my God, dude, you're going you're gonna to die. Uh, but we have to end uh, on the Utah Jazz. Obviously, they faced him twice in a row. In the finals, uh, Carl Malone just going off every finals game and obviously Stockton as well. And playing in Utah, RB3 now, we talked about Utah, but Utah is known for their crazy fans. Uh, even just last year with Russell Westbrook yeah. and the year before, they are notoriously uh, very passionate, uh, very angry. And I love the idea of Michael's kids not being there because <laughs> they probably would have kidnapped them or something. Uh, and fed him this poison pizza. <laughs> uh, 
but either way, uh, Utah, man, Utah went hard. Mark, you remember the Utah Jazz. Yeah, I, I remember when those two finals were going on and, and thinking that th this Jazz team is a credible threat to the Chicago Bulls. I don't care about the history. I, Jordan was the GOAT by then. We all accepted that. But this Jazz team was the very definition of a team. And Stockton and Malone ran that pick and roll so well, so effectively. And I will never forget as long as I live. I was telling you guys before we went to air, like I, I never rooted against Michael Jordan. I... I, 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 most times in my life, if I don't have a rooting interest in the team, I will usually pick the underdog. That's just, you know, I, I feel like the underdog in sports most of the time. I, I like Rudy. I, those are the kind of things that will get me going. And so part of me was like, oh, I wonder if the Jazz can pull this off or at least force a game seven in 98. And I remember like it was yesterday. I remember them. Stockton has the inbound. He gets it into Malone and Malone always did this and you could see Jordan and you could, it was like, it was like I was reading a comic book fellas and Michael Jordan had the thought bubble, like Carl's going to do this and I'm going to knock it out and I'm going to grab it. And that's exactly what happened. And I remember seeing that with the bulls down one and just realizing there's no way they're losing this game. They are not going to lose this game. And I also remember Costas, and I think it was Doug Collins or maybe Isaiah Thomas were on the broadcast talking about how Jordan's last few shots had come up short. They had hit the front of the rim because his legs were drained. And so uh, some people may think it's him posing or it's him trying to rub it in Brian Russell's face, which uh, you can give him the credit for doing that. He needed that extra follow through because he was hitting his shots short. So for an athlete of that caliber to make that adjustment in a moment like that, the steel is arguably as big as the shot to me, mm -hmm. but it all just wove together so perfectly into the lasting image that we're all going to have of Michael Jordan, the basketball player. Oh, absolutely. And not just that, but to, to echo everything JTE has said about Scottie Pippen, the idea of Pippen like intercepting the, the inbound pass mm -hmm. as well is just to me like even better because nowadays that would be regarded as like the best play uh, of the game is Pippen just stealing that possession because that's huge. Uh, obviously, JTE, you remember the Utah Jazz as well. Yeah, these two series against Utah Jazz are the memories that are the most clear to me uh, as a kid watching basketball. I remember thinking to myself, and I think Mark was saying, I didn't dislike Chicago, but I really wanted to see somebody else win. I just yeah. wanted to change something different. After like it was six years, five, six years of – Jordan winning. And the only time he, you know, he left the baseball is like a breather. There's a little bit of excitement in NBA when he left too, because you're like, okay, we could, the best player in the world is gone. Let's see somebody else actually try to win a title here. So I remember watching that last Utah series, really thinking finally somebody might be able to beat this guy. I just want to see somebody else have that moment and watching the game thinking, you know, Utah has a chance. It looks like they have the tools that they might actually be able to beat them. And again, they were leading for most of that last game. And then Jordan does what Jordan does, man. <laughs> and I remember watching as a kid, just being like, he's the greatest. There's nothing, nothing else you can do. Yeah. I mean, that has to be my final question. And I'll go to you first, RB3. Greatest of all time, basketball wise, best team of all time, basketball wise, greatest athlete of all time. Where, where are the rankings for you, RB3? Um, Okay, well, so I jokingly go back and forth with, with Kate Mulligan on SCN, um, as I, I've always proclaimed that Magic is, is a much better player than Michael Jordan. Ooh, um, I've so, never heard that. <laughs> I've never watch heard that. Argument. to hear that. <laughs> Yikes. This That's, is why I'm not watching that. <laughs> uh, okay. It's just a hot take. I mean, in, in our, in our, in our, in our real, realistic, uh, you know, measures, you can definitely look at the, the, the run that Michael Jordan had, the fact that he was – uh, six time, six time, uh, finals MVP, six times, uh, a championship winner, um, six time scoring title winner of the season. And he's the only, I think in, in, in the total of NBA history, there's been 10, or I, I'm sorry, it might actually be 11, uh, players who have simultaneously 11, 11 times in history that the season top score has also matched up with the championship winner yeah um and 11 times in nba history and michael jordan is six of them like no joke he literally has more than every other player combined so i guess 
like when you look at it from that perspective and you look at uh the the dominance that 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 they had and the, and the kind of the way that sh- that era of Chicago Bulls kind of transformed the NBA and blew it up to the point that it is now the way that David Stern kind of milked that franchise and made it to, to NBA, uh, made the NBA what it is now where every, every it's like yeah. one of the biggest sports in the entire world. So for that, you know, you gotta, you gotta give Michael Jordan love. Uh, he probably is the GOAT. He probably is. That probably is the greatest uh, basketball team of all time. Um, so yeah, there's no denying um, the kind of impact that that team has always had. Uh, uh, JT, Mark, do you guys agree or disagree? I Any of you? Champ. <laughs> I, all right, here's what I'll say. I think Jordan for me is the GOAT. Uh, I think okay. it's so hard when you come to different eras of the NBA to compare teams and players at times. But for me, yeah. the fact that he won Defensive Player of the Year several times, like you said, he was MVP. And the fact that he made his team, he didn't just raise his play. He raised his whole team play. And I don't know if I can say that about some of the other greats. I mean, Magic Johnson was a great – with assists, great score. But I just feel like nobody really captures the all-around, you know, aspects of basketball like Michael Jordan. It really wasn't a weak part of his game. And most players like LeBron, he's improved over the years, but, you know, he's changed also. It's so hard to debate, but for me, just as someone who's watched Jordan, watched Kobe, uh, watching LeBron, I still just got to give it to Jordan at the end of the day. And because the clutch gene is another thing. I feel like yeah. LeBron, that's one thing he's missing. I've seen too many games where LeBron just kind of disappears for a little bit at the most critical times. And like, there's one of my favorite moments in this documentary, but Rodman's like, I'm just standing over here. Because every mother effer knows Michael Jordan is going to take this shot and he's going to hit it. We're going to win our championship. Uh, I If LeBron had the ball with like 10 seconds to go, I would say it's a 50-50 shot whether he comes up or not. Like he might drive and get fouled. But with Jordan, I was like, he's going to do this. Yeah. If he even gets a chance, he's going to probably do it. So, And Kobe was close to that. Kobe is like the closest to me as far as like having that kind of feeling watching a player play, watching the Celtics lose to him in game seven mm-hmm. was, I felt like when, back when I watched Jordan, I was like, this, this guy can't be stopped. His will above everything else won't let him lose. And, you know, and, and, uh, and, you know, going, going off of that. I mean, I think people really, really legitimately forget how many last second shots Kobe hit. Like he hit so many last second shots. I, that was literally my entire childhood was just watching him hit like the, the most clutch last second shots. It was him and D- Derek Fisher. Like they always, it was always like reliable. D fish did it in a way that was a little, it was a little more showy. Like, and in, 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 like, and in, then he did it in probably a little bit bigger moments, but Kobe was consistently, he, if, if, if the shot needed to be taken, he would take it. And he would hit it. Even if there was two guys, three guys, four guys on him, he would still take the shot. Yeah. I remember being at a uh, – I, I was at some sports bar. Maybe I would just done, like, an open mic somewhere in, like, 2005 or something like that when I was first starting out in L.A. and watching Kobe just torch the trailblazers. I, I think it was even a regular wow. season game, but it was, it was towards the end of the game, and Kobe was just taking over a game. And I just remember th- having the thought, like, I haven't seen anybody do this like this since Jordan. I mean, there's been a lot of great players since Jordan. Allen Iverson could take over a game scoring. Um, obviously, uh, this guy is an all-timer, uh, but Kobe Bryant to me is the closest thing we've seen to Michael Jordan from a body type, from a game, and from a competitive mindset standpoint. But having said all that, I think Michael Jordan is the greatest athlete that has ever lived. I don't think that that Muhammad Ali is uh, somebody that is tough for me to compare to because I did not grow up in the era of Muhammad Ali. I didn't grow up in the era of Jim Brown. I grew up in the era of Michael Jordan. I've seen everybody since Michael Jordan. I think that basketball is uniquely qualified to show us individual greatness along with team leadership. Because if you take a sport like football, Tom Brady is the best quarterback that has ever lived, but it is such a team reliant sport and you have to rely on another 11 players to play defense to get you into position and mm-hmm. baseball is so individualistic that it's so hard to compare eras and it's so hard to compare hitters versus pitchers versus fielders. But basketball, you are doing everything on the court at all times. 
And for those reasons and so many more, the fact that Jordan had this mythic quality about him, that every eyeball is on him when he enters a room. It doesn't have to be a basketball court. It can be a mall. It, everybody is fixated on him, and you're almost in a spellbound state. And the only other athlete in my lifetime that I could even say is in the same ballpark with Michael Jordan from that regard is Tiger Woods. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously a debate that people are constantly literally probably having right now on Sports Center. Uh, it's the idea of not just the greatest of all time, greatest athlete of all time, which in my opinion is a whole different conversation because it's defining what is success inside your sports, which is a- another definition of what you can say about greatest of all time. I actually wrote a paper uh, talking about the greatest of all time and how to define that in, in, back when I was in school. But I think a lot of people, I'm going to give my, a little shout out to my sport, uh, forget about Michael Phelps uh, winning eight gold medals. Are you kidding me? Eight gold medals. He has more gold medals than any other Olympic athlete in the history of the Olympics. Uh, and when he won, and he was trying to hit eight, and when he got, when he won that 100 butterfly by .01, that's I was like, that's almost like destiny. That's almost like I can't lose. I'm not going to lose. Uh, and he just went medal after medal after medal, something that people didn't think was possible. So there's my my swimmer shout out. There's my ASU shout out because he's right. He trains at ASU, uh, my school. Uh, so I'm slightly biased there. But I still feel like it's different when you're in a team sport, like you said, Mark, because you have to hold your team together. And the way Michael did it is is unique to any other uh, so I put him as the greatest of all time. And obviously we have LeBron and Kobe and all this stuff. And if I'm being honest, when it comes to the LeBron and Kobe debate, I, I'm a Suns fan. Like, I know who Kobe is. <laughs> I would see him destroy us all the time, uh, especially in that playoff game that my friend always reminds me of, who's also a big Kobe fan. Uh, you don't have to remind me. I remember. I remember where I was watching that game. Uh, and he, you know, destroyed our chances for going to the finals with Steve Nash. Uh, but in my opinion, the game now, the, the NBA, the way basketball is played now, I always go back to what I said last week, the idea that LeBron James is currently not the leader in points, but the leader in assists in the NBA this season. That's huge. If you can pass the ball the way LeBron passes the ball and score and hit the threes and finish at the rim, putting your shoulder down, it's a tough debate as far as better player. But either way, I think Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. I think all four of us agree on that aspect, even though RB3 came in with a weird hot take about Johnson. But uh, <laughs> either way, uh, let's finish up with questions unless you guys have any more in the, in the I, comments I just want below. to say one thing any? about I, I, Tiger Woods is so like when Ellis mentioned Tiger Woods being up there, like with Michael Jordan, for me, like I put Ali closer because to me, having an opponent in front of you, having to like rise up to more, Ooh. it's hard for me to, is call a golfer an athlete in a lot of ways. I get it. It's very athletic. You have a bad knee or a bad back. You got to hit that ball. But I just, I, I, and you made a great point. Like Brady's one of the best quarterbacks of all time, but he relies on so many people. Yeah. Uh, and he's looking, I've seen the guy. He's not going to win any, you know, strongman competitions. He's not like a, an amazing athlete. He's just a great quarterback, a great football player. When I think of Ali and I think of Michael Jordan, it's not just that they're great in their sport, but their athletic skills, which I guess you could debate how much athletic skills you need to be a golfer. I don't know. It's kind of weird, but I understand what you're saying, Mark. He is probably the greatest golfer of all time. Yeah. Look, I'll, <laughs> all I'll say is that, uh, again, I never saw Muhammad Ali in his prime. I saw Tyson in his prime and yeah. as, as much, and, and as much fear as you could see in the eyes of some of those other boxers, there were boxers that were willing to get into the ring against Mike Tyson and against Muhammad Ali. If any other golfer had a choice between playing or not playing against Tiger Woods on Sunday in a major in the 2000s, they would stay at home. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, uh, RB3, do you have any questions? Uh, I don't have any on Streamlabs, people, if you want to send in uh, last round of Streamlab questions. This is your last chance. And by the way, we have just started this new thing. Uh, it's not a Schmobot. So don't call it no Schmobot. It ain't no Schmobot. But if you donate $10 or more, there will be a text-to-speech reader that will read your question, and we will monitor it before it comes through. So 
Um, yeah, if you, yeah. So if anybody donates more than ten dollars, you have your question read out loud by a weird robot computer thingy. Um, so, but we have a couple of we have a couple of super chats that we had before. I have one from F James seventy two who said, "Sorry for all the dub haters, uh, for dub nation haters. We are back next year. All teams are irrelevant." <laughs> I don't know what that means. Uh, the, I mean, is is Steph Curry Steph coming Curry. back? Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's, it's gonna be tough to, for him to, to build back to the place that he. Well, was he already before. is back. Yeah, he's. It, 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 they'll be competitive, and and I don't. I've never hated the Warriors, with the exception of Zsa Zsa Pachulia. If if Frankenstein didn't put his fat foot out for Kawhi Leonard to land on, then the Spurs might have a couple more rings for their fingers. But other than that, I'm a huge fan of the Warriors. And I think Steph Curry's changed basketball more than any athlete since Michael Jordan. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you on that. I'm I'm a big modern NBA guy, just because again, I go back to how big the threes are and the idea that even centers are hitting threes uh, pretty consistently now is incredible. Jonathan Peck says, question for you guys, besides OJ, what is everyone's favorite 30 for dirty documentary? My favorite is the U year of the scab. And this was XFL. Uh, JT. Uh, the OJ one where it's called like June and it's the date of the actual Bronco chase because it's like Phil Nicholson's last game, uh, the Knicks are in the finals and the way that's not like a talking head documentary, they use, the, they use the footage of all the channels and there's like that effect of changing the channel to all these different crazy events going around sports, the sports world. And then it's all intercut with the OJ chase that to me is one of my favorites, not just because it's fascinating that that many amazing sport things were happening in one day, but just the way it was formed and put together, I thought was really creative and cool. Um, Mark, do you have one? Yeah, it, Jonathan Peck, I know. I think he's from Virginia like uh, like I am. So you're the scab is way up there because that was the year that the Washington Redskins won Super Bowl 22, ultimately with Doug Williams being the uh, MVP. Uh, I th- a great one, and if you're watching this and you're enjoying or you did enjoy The Last Dance, and you definitely got to watch Jordan Rides the Bus, which is directed by Ron Shelton, who did White Men Can't Jump, who directed Bull Durham. Oh. He's a great director, and he directed that, and it gives you such a great insight into Michael Jordan. And, I mean, it, you want to go Ken Burns on it. Maybe it's not the most impartial and unbiased documentary, but by the end of that doc, you're like, maybe Jordan could have made it to AAA or to the majors <laughs> if he stuck with – baseball but as far as stories that i didn't know like i Bo, the bo jackson one is great because bo jackson is a walking tall tale you want to talk about just great pure athletes bo jackson's at the top of the list but one that i had no context of whatsoever going into it was the story of marcus dupree who was a great running back who got hurt and then went through just an incredible journey in trying to get to the league so that's another one to keep your eye on interesting rb3 you have one yeah, uh, mine is the one that I'm trying to f- find the exact year that it came out. But it's the uh, No, I believe it's called, and I'm getting the title. Sorry, it's mixed up right here. It's called uh, No Crossovers, The Trial of Ivan- Island Iverson. Uh, is directed yeah, by- I was going to mention that. Yeah, that's, that's the definitely- fight. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Now, that's easily one of my favorite um, documentaries. And it's directed by Steve James, who also did, um, I would argue, before – before this documentary and before this series um, was the greatest basketball documentary of all time and hoop, hoop dreams. He did hoop dreams and then he did uh, this 30 for 30 as well. Um, for me, I don't know if I, where I would rank either hoop dreams as a better documentary or this one. I, I honestly don't, I'm going back and forth with that because those are, these are two, they're very different documentaries and both about very different. different things. Um, but yeah, hoop dreams has always been my favorite documentary and that has been that's my favorite 30 for 30 just because it deals with not just the NBA, not just uh, basketball and not just the figure of Island Iverson, but also these greater themes of like racism and uh, and, you know, poverty and injustice that kind of has always lied through um, to the system. Yeah, it's incredible the effect that Allen Iverson had on the league that I think a lot of people forget about just in the idea of how the league is covered and the idea of of self self identification that each player now has with their own personal team, Instagram feed, like everything now that players are is much more uh, cr- created from Allen Iverson. So that one talks about that too. Um, final super chat is FJames72. He says, did anyone see the Mike at 53 video? 
Uh, I did I not. And he also one. says, uh, Bo is the greatest athlete of all time. Oh, I think there might have been a couple. I think there might have been one, one other one that we also have from F, uh, F James 72. Okay. He said, Ace is correct. Doesn't matter if Dre can hand check and Zaza uh, can be physical, then offense for dubs win every time. So talking about how, you know, yeah. Did you guys see the M50, Mike at 53 video that he's referring to? Because I haven't. Mm-hmm. I have not. Okay. And he also says Bo is the greatest of all time. Bo Jackson. That's a good one. It's, it, it, it's a great one. I mean, Bo Jackson is just a, it, it's a walking tall tale. That guy. Yeah. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, JTE and Mark Ellis for being on this. Hopefully I didn't keep you guys too long. I try to keep it as short as I can, but uh, it, when we're talking about Michael Jordan, when we're talking about the Chicago bulls and we're talking about basketball, uh, it's something that we have to keep going and keep talking about, but uh, uh, where can everyone find you at? I'll start with you, Mark. Uh, it, it doesn't matter where they can find me. What matters is that we just saw 10 hours of a documentary and they shot 500 hours of footage that season. Release the Snyder Cut. Give me <laughs> the full version of The Last Dance. I want to see it all. And I'll tell you what, man, the, the best thing about this documentary that I got to enjoy so much the last five weeks is seeing the player interactions that you always knew happened, but that you would never mic up. Like even tonight, seeing Jordan when Larry Bird was the coach of the Pacers, seeing that quick embrace after Jordan beat him, or seeing Jordan just shake the hands very cordially of Malone and Stockton as they're uh, walking past each other going in and out of the press conference room after Jordan just beat them in game two. It was just that kind of stuff. Is just, you cannot put a price on footage like that for a fan like me. So it was just, it was a thrill to get to watch it. And you can watch my special dog stepfather and you can hear uh, RB3 in dog stepfather on Amazon prime just got up there. So go check it hey, out. Links, hey, links in the description down below. Thank you, bud. Mm-hmm. There you go. Uh, JTE. Uh, yeah. JTE movie. Thanks YouTube and Twitter, all that good stuff. I do have a new show that I'm doing with our own Tom Dagnino, Bobby Gucci. Uh, every Wednesday called Ask Gucci. It's very much not for kids. But if you want to learn some life lessons from Tom, that's the place to go. I'm just there for a little color commentary. Uh, check it out. Get educated. It's on the Finstock Initiative YouTube channel. And I'll be every Wednesday night. I think we're doing 9 o'clock. Yeah, 9 o'clock on the Pacific Coast. So oh. check that out. Amazing. RB3. Um, yeah, you can find me not enjoying my Sundays anymore. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do now for Sundays. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm kind of with you, Mark, for uh, on some level. Like I do kind of wish there, there was like an, at least another like two parts, like just to give us more just raw footage. Like I would wish they could just give us just clips of just the footage. The like, footage. That footage was yeah. amazing. <laughs> um, and I don't know, for some reason I felt like even though like they wrapped up, the story, like, I still feel like there was still a lot more material they could have got into. I don't know. If you, if, if you oh, want something yeah. fun for 15 minutes to go watch, um, I can't remember the kid's name off the top of my head, but um, it was this kid from Oregon State who they talk about in the documentary, but you can watch, like, pretty much the full game happen when Jordan, uh, somebody's talking shit about how Mike left at the right time because this guy was coming in um, and he was drafted by the Bulls. And so Jordan shows up a year and a half after he retired from the Bulls the second time to the Bulls practice facility out of the blue and just points the kid out and says, come here. And they go one-on-one and he just smokes him. And there's like a 15-minute YouTube documentary that somebody did on it. It's really good. So there's a there's a cool rabbit hole of like mini documentaries about the Bulls team. You can go down on YouTube. Um, maybe save it for next Sunday, Robert, just to give you a nice smooth landing pad back down to earth. Yeah. And I'm, also, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just quick recommendation. Uh, if you have HBO, HBO Go, HBO Now, uh, Bird vs. Magic. Yep. It's about two, two, ah. two and a half hours. It'll give you a little bit, you know, reminiscent of what before Jordan. And I think it's a great lead into this 10 part documentary. Or if you haven't seen it yet, go back, watch it. Watch the two guys who were the face of the league. And when they saw Jordan, were like, oh, shit, <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy. Uh, mm-hmm. It's fascinating. Yeah, obviously, there's a ton of stuff to recommend going out there. I recommend Game of Zones if you like Game of Thrones or if you like basketball at all. I think that's incredible. Uh, yeah. And obviously I I still think that they're doing 30 for 30 weekly now, which I think is incredible. They're doing a Lance Armstrong one, a baseball one, uh, and the Bruce Lee one, which I actually would love to do a video about because Bruce Lee is my childhood 
all in a nutshell. He like created who I am. Yeah. Um, so I definitely want to do that. Uh, but yeah, guys, thank you again for joining us. Uh, subscribe to First Cut if you haven't done so already. We have a ton of videos. We have other live streams that we've done before. Uh, you know, we can, reviews. I, I was going to say we should probably announce this week what we're going to do for our Thursday live oh, stream. Oh, yeah. I think we've already talked about it, but this week we're doing an exclusive episode of the Meaning of Podcast live. That's right, the Meaning of Live. Um, so be sure to check that out. It's going to be really, really fun. Uh, this is going to be our first time kind of playing with that format. So see how that all goes. There you oh, go, wait, guys. So make of, sure you guys tune in. Speaking of goats, wait, somebody else wanted to say hi real quick. Uh oh. Let's just uh, see. Uh, oh, my uh, God. Oh, there she is. Hey. <laughs> She's like, You guys talking about me? All of this. Goat. All this, all this pappy watching sports, just she's she's exhausted, she's worn out, she is so sick of the bulls. Yeah, uh, thank you guys again for watching. Thank you, Mark and JT, for joining us for the meeting of crew. I'm Andres, this is RB3. JT, that's JT, and that's no, Mark Ellis. I don't know. We're all we're all different spots. <laughs> I'm here, Ellis is down there for me. All right, we're peacing out, guys. Bye. <laughs>